I'd like to invite the panelists up now, and I'll come join you down just the way, so please join us. You all have in your programs Hi, thank you for doing everybody's program. introduction, but for the purpose of those of you in the room and for the purpose of those of you who are watching us from around the world, getting ready to send your questions in, I hope, uh, let me uh, quickly move down the line. Uh, John Lansing is CEO and Director of the Broadcasting Board of Governors. <clears throat> he oversees all aspects of U.S. international media, and that includes POA, OCB, RFE, RL, Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty, RFA, MBN. He joined the BBG in September of 2015 uh, after nine years as President of Scripps Network. Uh, he has uh, a long and very distinguished career in media, um, publishing, and uh, journalism. Brings a deep passion and commitment uh, to all of those things, to his current job. Uh, Michael Oreskes is an exceptional uh, journalist, um, and he's now Senior Vice President of News and Editorial Director at NPR. <clears throat> he has four decades in journalism. He was a reporter, managing editor, and he has really overseen and experienced the transition in journalism from that print thing that we were talking about to this sort of sprawling digital creature that we now try to understand and tame. And finally, Elise Labatt, who is a, not just a former colleague of mine, but a dear friend. She is a, now CNN's global affairs correspondent. She covers U.S. foreign policy, international affairs, and uh, she has a multiple passports that have lots of stamps in them because she has reported now from more than 75 countries. So this group is really remarkably well positioned to begin this conversation uh, on this notion of what international media are and what they're, what they're faced with. So for the purposes of the conversation though, and just let me lay this out for you all as well as for the audience so you understand, we want to come at the sort of deconstructing international media from two basic perspectives. Perspective one, how do American audiences put their brains around the world and how do, what is our role and challenge in doing that? And number two, how do we get America and the rest of the world to the rest of the world? So that's not too big a topic to do in about 30 minutes. So, <laughs> so let's, let's start. Um, and I'd like to start um, by throwing this question out. I think we just heard the ambassador make reference to the right of people to information. And Michael, let me let you start it and then it's a jump ball from there. Do we confront a fundamental basic new reality or somehow altered reality now, amplified reality perhaps, that from the most authoritarian governments to the least, mm -hmm. this notion that the free flow of credible, accurate information and fact is a right is somehow more under siege? I think so. I think this is the most difficult time to be a journalist, uh, probably since World War II, if not even before that. Um, it's clear that many governments, you know, and, they, and they run the gamut from truly despotic places to th places we might even have looked at as democracies, <laughs> where controlling the flow of information uh, has become a principal tool of their government. And it's made it extremely difficult, and in some cases extremely dangerous, to gather news. As and we just saw with the... With as we the just saw, and as, as you know, we lost two journalists last year in Iraq, uh, I'm sorry, in Afghanistan, who were on the very basic mission of trying to understand how the war was going as the United States turned over the fighting uh, to the Afghan army, a fundamental public policy question for Americans, for citizens to understand. And I think the... The fundamental challenge that we're seeing is that, you know, when the framers wrote the First Amendment, they, they put a free press in with a series of other rights. And when you look at all those rights as a whole, their idea was very clear, that a free press is one of the essential ingredients of a free democracy. And that if any of those pillars, including the other rights they, they, um, they protected in the First Amendment, as any of them fall, the whole thing begins to fall. And that's often the objective, which is if you can control the information, you can control the society. So we find, and our mission, of course, is fundamentally to bring a clear picture of the world to American audiences. 
we find that job is becoming more difficult and more dangerous. Elise? Well, and I mean, it's a two-way street, right? We're having a problem bringing the world to Americans because of what's going on um, around the world and the dangers. And it's not just, you know, physical dangers. You know, nowadays, you know, laws are being set in various countries. And whether that's in Turkey and we see the crackdown going there with the rest of thousands of journalists or in democracies um, like Israel or European countries where, you know, the line is, is much more shady. But if you're reporting on a certain element of government or there are libel laws that, you know, make it very murky about what's legal and what's not. So it's overt and it's, and it's a little subvert. How but, and how has that affected the way you and CNN do your work? Well, because you're I mean, both CNN domestic and CNN international. Well, and I mean that, you know, there's, there's elements of, um, you know, we have to be careful about, you know, what we report. And that's when a standards and practices department, you know, our old friend Rick Davis or such will, you know, it's where we're, we're much more, you know, careful about whether we're going to be sued. You know, the, the, it used to be that if we had the sources and we checked our facts very carefully, um, you know, that would be enough. And because the law was on our side. It's not always on our side anymore. And I also feel not only is it more difficult for us to bring you know, the world to America, it's becoming increasingly more difficult to bring America to the world because of the climate that we have here. It's not just about law and danger. It's about respect for the press. John, first of all, let me thank you and thank BBG for helping to put this conversation together. Appreciate that very much. I'm very interested in your take on this, sure. having especially now heard uh, sort of from the private sector here. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for partnering with us, Frank. That's great. Uh, Chairman Ed Royce of the House Foreign Affairs Committee coined a term about two years ago, and that's the weaponization of information. Mm. And I think that term great is term. actually very accurate. Uh, you look at what's happening coming out of the Kremlin, and it's really almost beyond uh, a false narrative. It's more of a strategy to establish that there's really no such thing as an empirical fact. Facts are really what are being challenged around the world by these regimes, and you see that now happening in Turkey as well. And if you think about it, once you have a, an audience that doesn't trust any set of facts, then you really have no way for that community, that, that uh, audience to debate anything on a realistic level because there's no agreed to set of facts. Right. And I think that's actually the strategy. Has that really changed or how has that changed? Because um, certainly when, when I was at the Voice of America many, many years ago, it was principally a shortwave broadcast operation. But we were welcome like the BBC World Service was at the time behind the Iron Curtain because the propaganda there was anti-fact. So what's changed, John? Well, what's changed is the medium has changed so much between social media, uh, <laughs> putting the ability for people to affect the, the uh, flow of information, the flow of facts into hundreds, if not thousands, of hands of, of internet trolls that can just flood the zone with, with uh, not just distortions, but outright black and white false narratives. And it makes it all the more challenging for Voice of America or Radio Free Europe or CNN or NPR to really stand up against a storm of disinformation and try to establish a set of clear facts. And I also think consumers of the media, because there are so many more um, outlets and they're able to target you know, a certain base of people that are looking for that type of information. I think consumers are much less discerning about what's a fact and what's not. So let me ask each of you then how you and your organizations are countering this world of anti-fact, fake news, troll farms, bots, all of, all of this that is so confusing, again, in this international context. Yeah, it's a really important question because it does, one of the things that is undermined by the, um, by this phenomenon of attacking the fundamental idea of fact is the fundamental base of journalism. <laughs> Since we are more than anything based on the idea that we are gatherers and verifiers of fact. That's our, mm -hmm. our been our principle for, for a long time. So 
I think there are two parts to this. Part one is to reaffirm that we actually believe there are facts. I can't believe actually that I have to say that, but I do. Mm -hmm. And that we believe in our role of establishing and verifying what is a fact and of distributing it to the public. But how do you do that? Well, I, I don't I think... Mean, how do you do, yeah. not, not, not how do you do that for your own process, but how do you do that <clears throat> for the comprehension of the audience? No, no. Well, that's part two. So part one is just establishing and verifying a fact. And that actually, most journalists are pretty good at that. We know how to track down where information came from. We understand how to interview people or how to verify with records. Or I mean, we could spend all day just on the technique of verifying fact. But, but we actually do know how to do that, and we are pretty good at that. We don't get it right every time, but we understand how to do it. What we're trying to learn now is when we're thrown on our back feet by the fact that a part of the world simply doesn't even accept the game the way we've always played it, so what do we do then? And I think that's the place where we're trying to reestablish our footing. How do we communicate to a broad public and reach people and reestablish, frankly, our credibility in this, in this tsunami of other kinds of material, I won't even call it information, although I guess it's a kind of information, how do we establish ourselves and reach people and establish a relationship with audiences that says, we're actually the ones you can All right, so how do you do that? Well, I think, so... Aside from saying it's NPR, it's the brand. Trust right, the brand. well, and that, and that helps, but that's not, you know, that's a starting point, but, uh, you know, for us, of course, first, we focus most importantly in the United States. And... We do several things. First of all, I, I believe very strongly that the place where you can reach people most effectively is at the local level. And by the way, I think that's a global point. Like, you're much more likely to reach people. I, I, we have some colleagues here from, from Georgia and Ukraine and, and other Eastern European countries. They're a lot more likely to reach people in their country at the local level than we are sitting here in if, Washington. If they can. If they can. And, and, and this is not... This is a daily process, not a thing that happens all at once. But, so we focus very heavily at NPR on the process of working with our stations in communities to establish sometimes even face-to-face -face events. Local news is extremely important in this process because it establishes a relationship of trust in which people actually know the news that you're covering and they can actually judge you for it. And it's actually very perilous because you get that wrong and they really know you're wrong. So it's a very, and it's a, it's a real, it's not a thing, it's a process. It's a, you, you deal with people every day and you get up the next morning after you've done what you did the day before and you come back and you face them and you take the brick bats for what you got wrong or for what they didn't like but was actually true. And it's, it's not something that you just put out there and let go. You can't fire and forget journalism in the old way. You go back and engage with people. So John, let me put that question to you. What do you do? And let me again draw the parallel to when I was at the Voice of America. If somebody got misinformation there, it might have come from a place called Pravda. So you had the brand there, and the brand was known to be propaganda or whatever it was. Now, in, in, in the world we're in now, it comes without a brand, or it comes with a brand you don't recognize, or it comes with a, with a deliberately misleading brand, and, and that's the fake news. It's harder to, uh, to identify. So how do you counter that? So one of the ways we counter that is by what we don't do, and that is we don't do propaganda. And oftentimes I'll be in meetings around town or even somebody on the Hill that'll say, why don't we fight fire with fire? Why do we let them tell a narrative? Why don't we tell a, a narrative that supports this or that? And the answer to that is if we did that, we would no longer have the credibility which we have earned over 75 years in 45 languages, by the way, so it's all local. Um, and it, it causes us, I think, to remind ourselves that we hold ourselves accountable to these audiences that they trust us. So fundamentally, the only way we can counter disinformation, whether it's coming from a thousand bots or from RT, is to hold up our credibility and the trust we have with our audience so that they believe us. But is that enough? Well, we hold ourselves accountable to that. And we, not just on reaching our audience, but asking our audience to let us know if we're, if we're having meaning for them. And by and large, we remain, we are remaining uh, able to do that. Is it enough? We're expanding rapidly right now away from radio and television uh, into digital, social, and mobile platforms. We are allowing our audiences and we're creating platforms for our audiences, which you'll hear about later, for them to talk to one another on platforms that we've presented to them. And we're giving them a chance to have their voice heard amongst each other. Um, 
the reality is this is a tough battle we're in. It truly is a war of information. And I don't use that term lightly. This notion of the weaponization of information can really have dire consequences for our country. Just look at the involvement of the Russians in our last election, which everybody agrees happened. Uh, if we can't see the impact of that information war affecting us at that level and not be really alarmed and really stepping up our, our investment in and our ability to counter it with factual, contextual, true information, then I really fear what the consequences yeah. might be. This is, this is incredibly important. I think another way of describing this point, which I agree with, is, is that in a war of information, the journalists have to be careful not to be sucked in as combatants. Mm -hmm. We're not on any side in this fight. We are on the side of trying to establish the facts and distributing them in ways that we hope will be effective, and that's where our credibility and our independence comes from. Exactly. I mean, I think that it's almost that, you know, it's one, one side is, you know, mm -hmm. we're, we're the bad guy if we're not criticizing the other side. And I think it's, it's kind of diverted us away from our mission of just telling the facts. Because now, instead of you know, going about and doing your daily reporting of the news and what's out there, you're spending your day trying to deconstruct or you know, tell the real story of the fake news that was out there in the first place. And so it's kind of added this extra layer of our job, which is, which is very difficult. A couple of things here. First of all, I think it's exactly true what you said about that the mission of, of BBG has always not been propagandizing. I'm concerned, I have to say, I'm sure you've heard anecdotal evidence that there is, in more, that there is more interest now in using the BBG and its various organizations as a tool of a US narrative by the new administration. I hope that doesn't happen. I've been concerned about it. Um, I think for us, we're evolving, both on the digital side and the social media side, and about you know how we're going to present our our news to the public. Right now, we're doing it with a hell of a lot of panels, which are you know more punditry and, and analysis, um, and not necessarily just fact, fact based. Hardly. And you know, that is going to the digital side and the mobile side and whatever. And TV is becoming less important to us because that's just a kind of chat forum. And our news gathering and our storytelling is more becoming a digital enterprise. But you know, we are, we're feeling our way. And now that, that we're being seen as fake news, again, it's causing us to spend our day either defending ourselves or repackaging re the facts to show that our facts are right instead of our original mission, which is to just do the reporting and let it speak further. I'm, I want to pick up on what you, what you said and, and turn to you, John, and yep. I put that directly to you. You pointed out that there are many who say, rightly in your view, that news and information have been weaponized. And there are those who say, okay, well, if that's the fact, then you need to step up your game and be weaponized too. And that starts to move us more towards more of a propagandistic perspective that if you're going to be a weapon, you've got to be sharper and louder and, and, and land with more than a, than, a, than a few words and a thud. Right. This is an interesting point because it also uh, suggests to us that our own journalism isn't always perfect. Uh, for example, a report was published back in February soon after the inauguration that the White House had quote unquote taken over the BBG and they were going to turn it into Trump TV and there were quotes of people who thought, boy, that would be terrible. There are quotes of people, that would be horrible. And the headline said, BB, uh, Voice of America being taken over by the White House. Well, the only problem with that widely circulated article that was repeated on MSNBC is that it wasn't true. And it Where did it come from? Do you know? It came from a reporter's imagination. A, a real reporter? A real or a reporter. fake reporter's imagination? No, a real reporter. It, did it, it come from their imagination or did it come from a source, a source somewhere that maybe not necessarily like that were, that is very close in the inner circle of the White House, but you know, there is this, you know, maybe there are some people that are discussing it and that, you know, this is the, th this is a well, thing. Let me, let me just say this. It was not sourced to anybody in the White House mm -hmm. and the reporter didn't call me mm -hmm. and didn't call the director of the Voice of America 
and had nothing in it that was factually correct. Now, if somebody were to try to take over the BBG, I'd be the first to say something about that. But the thing that people need to understand is that it would be illegal to do that. It's written into the charter of the, of the, of the BBG. There's a firewall against it. I understand that, but there's always been a tension. There was ages ago inside these organizations about how much straight news you're doing and how much explanation of U.S. policy you're doing. Well, explanation you, of U.S. policy is a part of our charter. I understand that, but explanation of U.S. policy can take on different tones and, 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 and can be perceived by different people in different ways and can be not, not necessarily pro propaganda, but it certainly could be telling America's story has different variations. I guess I'd have to see an example of something that somebody would debate. I have not had one t you know, brought to me. I can, I can only just say that if there were pressure from the government on the BBG, the first one to raise their hand would be me. Let me ask you, let me ask you one question, John, because I got some input from folks who said, you know, there are some, there are some interesting issues here, and one of them I want to ask you about, for example, was um, a VOA instance where uh, you had a very interesting, in the Mandarin service, uh, interview uh, with a billionaire Chinese businessman who has tried to blow the whistle on corruption in the Chinese government. Very controversial character there. Guo Wengui is his name. And um, you had an interview ongoing with him. He was on for an hour, and then people were told to, to, to stop the interview. And there was some feeling that that was pressure from the Chinese government coming through to you, or to, not to you, but to, to others in the chain of command. Uh, what's your response to that? How responsive are you to those outside pressures in tailoring your coverage of this complicated world? Well, there was no pressure from the Chinese government that caused anything to change, and, will there, and there never will be. Um, well, first of all, I would say an hour of live TV isn't nothing. Uh, it's pretty significant. And then I would say... CNN, it's everything. <laughs> and then I would say uh, I'm still gathering facts on this situation. But in terms of just the tenets of good journalism... Um, it was discussed prior to this interview that it would be important to perhaps not do three hours live, perhaps do an hour live and then do fact gathering, do the interview on tape for the remaining two hours, and then do some verification of the information, actually do some reporting. Mm -hmm. And somewhere between the uh, early agreement to do that and the actual interview, something got lost, and I have to find out what that is. But as a matter of principle, I would prefer that rather than giving a mic for three hours on controversial information to perhaps we would limit it to an hour and then gather, fact gather the other information and report on it and find out if we can verify any of it. I think one of the things that is a heightened challenge for everybody in this world is just how live in real time everything is. Yeah. And that is another thing that's, that's been a challenge. I want to raise just something very quickly that, um, about the issue of weaponization of information. Yeah. And it's not just about a, you know, a story that's out there and it could be fake or it could be not. I feel like there are officials in this government that are using the media as weapons of information. And so... In this government, like, you're talking about the United you, States. Well, government. I mean, yeah, yes, and I'm not saying it's indigenous to the Trump administration. It, it was also true in Obama and, and, uh, and others. But you said something about that this story um, about Trump TV, um, you know, was false and there was nobody... There are... are you know, people that use the media to get their message out as, you know, and that's a weapon, if it's, especially if it's not true. And so that makes our job even more important to know that and to know that you're being used as a weapon and to double check those facts. Uh, we're going to go to questions from the audience in just a couple minutes, but I'd like to, there's one other very important thing. I know you're going to have another conversation a bit on, on the, the notion of press and reporter safety. Yeah. But I'd like to ask that in a slightly different context just to get your reactions to this first. Um, it was a time when it might have been dangerous to be a war correspondent because it's always dangerous to be a war correspondent. But if you were a foreign correspondent someplace in any other country, you weren't a target in the way you are now. And part of the reason you're a target now is because once upon a time we thought they need us. They need us to tell their story. And so in some strange way, we're their ally. They don't anymore. Boko Haram, ISIS, they have very ro robust media operations of their own. They don't need Elise. They don't need Michael. They don't need you or any of your reporters to get their story out, or so they may think. And so we have these horrific tales of people losing their lives, being taken hostage, all this other business. And so we have higher, heightened security now around the world when reporters go out, places that reporters don't go. I want to ask you how that's affected the editorial product because part of the magic of being a reporter someplace is to get out 
and to talk to people. And now if you can't or if you're surrounded by security guards, how do you feel that this is affecting the actual journalism that is being committed by those who are still going? Yeah, I think it's a very important problem. It clearly limits our ability to find things out. Um, and, and, you know, the, the ISIS, Boko Haram is the extreme example. That's 100% control of information. Basically, it is, it is to, to risk your life to attempt to enter their territory. So you really cannot know what's going on until people leave their territory. And that is fundamentally how we know most of what we know about what's happening inside areas controlled by groups like that. But it's become an increasingly serious problem in everywhere from Turkey to South Sudan to Egypt. Um, it's, it's become more difficult to operate as a journalist. And that means that people receive a less rounded, less complete view so of the world. So is NPR doing less coverage, or do you feel it's getting less of a full picture that... I, I think we fight every day to try to complete the job of painting a full picture when, uh, and it's much more difficult than it used to be. So I worry a lot that there are lots of things we don't know because we can't actually get there. We can't get access to people. And it, it causes you to have to rely, you know, we're covering less of Syria. I mean, we go into Syria very, you know, very carefully and under very certain strict security procedures. Um, and so it forces us to rely more on sources on the ground via social media, via phone, um, and, it, and it limits, it definitely limits the reporting. I want to talk about one other limit of reporting that people don't talk about that much, but, um, and, it, and I, you know, tonight we're going to be honoring Jim Foley, who was killed by um, ISIS. Um, but there's another type of danger that journalists are facing right now, and that's um, on social media. And that's curtailing mm. reporting. It's okay. fine. That's a great point. Okay. Um, it used to be that if you um, report a story, the facts would speak for themselves. You're keeping, you know, someone honest, and you know you're you have the you know facts on your side. We're the pious journalists who come out and and tell the story. And now through social media and the bullying and the you know tarnishing of people's reputations. Not that people care about their reputations. Um, but the, the bullying that goes on, it makes editors less, you know, um, willing to just, you have your two sources, go with the story. There's much more of a consideration of, well, are we going to be accused of, you know, being too anti-Trump or too pro-Trump or too, you know, in, in Turkey, you know, are we going to get arrested and not be able to get back in? What can we say? Um, about this government, is this going to be an impediment to this us? This is different and tougher than it's been. I think it's much different. And the advent of social media has made editors a lot, not all of them, but many of them, that's much more of a consideration now. And I think that's, it's not a physical danger. I don't want to equate that with, you know, the risk that journalists are putting their lives, physical lives in danger. But it is, I think, much more of a, of a uh, straight jacket than it used to be. Michael. Intimidation takes a whole series of forms. And, and one thing I think is very important for us to say directly, most of what we know about the world actually comes from local journalists in their countries. And most of the journalists killed are local journalists, mostly from the, killed in their own countries or from neighboring countries. Uh, you use the phrase foreign correspondent. The truth is, as tragic as, yes, as it yes, is, when yes. we lose a David Guilty or somebody else, and as much attention as that gets, most of the journalists who die in doing their work are local journalists. And that seizes and cuts off information in, a, in an extraordinary way before it even reaches the level of a global story. There are things we just never hear about totally. in places from Mexico um, to Cameroon where we don't even know what we don't know because the local journalists are intimidated by murder and by uh, jailings that um, are very damaging to the way we understand the world. So beyond the uh, health and safety of journalists around the world, and I particularly want to commend the journalists of the BBG, many of whom are local journalists who have risked their lives, there's also the uh, threat and the actual imprisonment uh, of journalists. We had 
Hadija in uh, Azerbaijan who is in prison for months and so she was taken off of her ability to do the local investigative reporting because she was in jail. Yeah. This very day a trial is beginning for RFERL Stringer in Crimea for the crime of reporting the truth about the invasion of, uh, of Russia into Crimea. And so the threat of, 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 uh, of jail or the actual jailing of journalists is a serious and growing uh, inhibitor of journalism. And didn't the, world. the vice president just say that the US, that the administration is looking at libel laws once again? What is what is libel? I I, I, I want to say too that uh, what happens in this country matters way beyond this country. We have the privilege at uh, SMPA of having Jason Rezaian as a fellow, mm -hmm. and he was recounting one of his interrogations to us, where his interrogators said. Well, America's got Guantanamo, essentially, you know, so don't, don't worry, you know, you're where you belong, you know, and, and so what we do and what we say resonates, and when the President of the United States refers to journalists as enemies of the people, that is a very concerning thing. It's a that, dog whistle. That, that enables others That's right. not only to say it, but to act on it. Yeah, there was a wonderful we, clip at the... White House Correspondents' Dinner this Saturday night, they showed a clip of Ronald Reagan yes. in Moscow yes. lecturing yes. the Russians and explaining yes. to them yes. that a free and independent yes. press composed of hundreds of independent yes. organizations yes. was one of the great guarantees of liber liberty. And it was a very moving moment. I was there for that speech. I was on that speech. And I remember the President of the United States standing, and you have to, for those of you who are too young, Okay? It was Cold War time. We had nuclear weapons aimed at one another. There was a wall. It was red, you know, and, and they, we're, we were in the, in the heart of the communist world, and the President of the United States stood in front of young people at Moscow State University and said, one of the bedrock principles of a democracy is a loud, uncontrolled, undisciplined, cacophonous press. He didn't use those words, but... But that was the point. That's what he meant. <laughs> well, th th there was just some, very quickly, there was um, also a journalist from Politico that was honored Saturday night for um, ex examining the press conference where President Obama was standing next to Raul Castro, and Raul Castro was forced to answer questions because President Obama was. So, it, I, I mean, the leadership that the U.S. shows on this issue makes a, makes a very big difference, and when they are sending a signal to other countries that they don't, dis they don't respect the press. You know, it's okay to disrespect the press wherever you are. And want. shocking as this was to learn, during this last campaign, I was hearing from former colleagues who had to go to political rallies accompanied by security right. in the United States yes. of America. That had not happened before, ever, to my knowledge, at least not in our lifetime. Let's go to the mics and some questions, please. And uh, in the interest of time, if you could direct it as a question, short, sweet, and perfect, <laughs> um, we will respond in kind. Go ahead. Hi, thank you. Uh, Rachel Alto, reporter with Congressional Quarterly. Uh, Martha Sales, a teacher at Boston College and an expert on public diplomacy, she had some words of criticism for BBG recently. She said that the BBG doesn't really know what it's doing right now. The criticism on the right is that they're not hard-edged enough in promoting U.S. government, um, particularly with an idea to the, 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 the system of government of America, First Amendment stuff. And uh, those on the left feel like anything that smacks of uh, propaganda, we can't go near. But um, in light of all the, the uh, signals coming from Capitol Hill that they do want to do something to increase funding for BBG and for um, uh, pushing back against Russian influence in uh, Eurasia, what would you say to that, John? I mean, do you think BBG needs to reassess its mission? Uh, no, I don't think it needs to reassess its mission to inform, engage, and connect people around the world in support of freedom and democracy is our mission, has been, and will be. In terms of confronting and growing, uh, confronting the disinformation and growing the influence of the BBG, just in February, we launched the first 24-7 Russian language cable network through Radio Free Europe in partnership with Voice of America. It's a response directly to concerns on Capitol Hill that we weren't doing enough in terms of information in the Russian-speaking world. And now that network is carried by over 31 cable and satellite uh, firms in nine different countries growing rapidly in large parts of the world with great uh, uh, diasporas of Russian language speakers such as Jerusalem. Um, and we're investing more in that effort. We're also looking at uh, growing our investment in China, North Korea, South Korea, uh, with all that's going on in the, in the South China Sea and in North Korea. So the, 
The critics are, are varied. They come from both sides, as you say, of the political spectrum. Um, we accept any honest criticism, as any good journalist or organization should, and, and we listen. Um, but we're also not standing still, and we're rapidly growing our influence, having grown our audience by 52 million in the last year, and holding ourselves accountable to an impact model beyond audience reach. Uh, and that's been very well received on Capitol Hill. What's that impact model? What does that mean? It's a, it's a set of 28 uh, measurements in all of our markets that, that indicates whether our information is trustworthy, if it's being shared, if it's creating some community action. And that's the accountability we're holding ourselves to, not just that it reached an audience, but what happened as a result of it reaching the audience. Next question. Uh, Alex Howard, Sunlight Foundation. Uh, we heard an undersecretary from the State Department speak to um, the effects of a government trying to delegitimize the press uh, as a way to control facts, to create as what maybe this part of the world might even call alternative facts. Um, what does it mean when we have a president who, instead of hailing the importance of democracy as President Reagan just did, um, and the importance of journalists to democracy, the importance of them holding the executive accountable, holding Congress accountable, ferreting out corruption. During this weekend, when we celebrated the First Amendment, attack the press. And it was not an accident that you have Carl Bernstein standing up there and talking about his experience during Watergate of having the president attack the press at the same time they were reporting out what's going on. Um, what does it mean when the president of the United States is publicly an enemy of press freedom and his rhetoric. And as you mentioned, his chief of staff has even posited the idea that there should be changes to the libel laws as to an amendment. How does it affect your work? How does it affect what NPR does? How does it affect how you report out um, what he says if he's laundering information that propaganda channels from other parts of the world are putting out? I well, you want to start? Yeah, and Frank and I have toiled in the political wars of journalism for many years, and it, it is not um, uh, completely unique to be attacked by a president. What I think is unusual here is the extent to which this president has taken on the fundamental principle of an independent press in a way that's quite different from the past and quite unfortunate. It's not a healthy thing. He's taken a political strategy from his campaign, and he's continued, continued it into office. And I think that does much more harm than good. Um, we're not perfect. He's not perfect. Uh, we have a lot to learn about the country and about uh, reaching out to each other. But the most chilling thing that's been said by his administration, frankly, was not that we are enemies of the people. We're not enemies of the people, obviously. The thing that I found most disturbing was when his administration said that we were a opposition party. That's as clear as day. That's an effort to paint us as partisans. It's an effort to make us combatants in his information war. And I decline. Uh, or as my colleague Marty Barron likes to say, we're not at war, we're at work. And I, I firmly believe that <laughs> doing our work is what the country overall will benefit from. And over time, most Americans will understand that an independent press is one of the great protectors of their liberty. The First Amendment right to a free press was not a grant to me as a journalist. It was a grant to all of us as citizens. And that's a purpose. And I think it would be good if uh, we all came back together around that. Elise, John, and then we'll have to wrap up. A um, couple things. First of all, fake news now doesn't mean that our reporting is wrong and our facts are wrong. It means that they don't agree with the narrative that we've put out. So it's not about facts anymore. It's about whether you're supporting um, a certain policy or you're you know, pointing out criticism. Criticism is fake news now. So that's very dangerous. Um, and it's not just the president. You know, Ambassador Wharton mm -hmm. came up and said all these really nice things about you know, democracy around the world. It would be nice if it started with the Secretary of State, who has pretty much said, I don't need the media. I don't w need to talk to the media. You know, I don't need to explain to the American people what my policies are. Um, and that is very dangerous. 
um, that they don't feel that they need to do that. And, and at the State Department in particular, we've been, you know, really kind of, you know, the White House, for wh whatever President Trump is saying about the opposition party in the media, he's calling the Washington Post and the New York Times, and so are his aides. And I think, you know, even though it's uncomfortable and it's annoying, I mean, yes, they're under assault, but I think at the State Department, we're really feeling the pressure because they don't feel that they need um, to explain it. When you have someone who's supposed to be the top public diplomat and the U.S. face of foreign policy around the world not wanting to talk to the media, some of the journalists who've been covering it for decades and really trying to get at the nuance of foreign policy, when that's not important, I mean, not only is it personally hurtful as a student of foreign policy, but I think that's a fundamental um, danger to U.S. democracy. John? I think to the extent that the rest of the world is not hearing from the United States and the administration that press freedom is important, that that causes press freedom to erode in other places. And I think, I think that the, the world looks to us for leadership on many levels. This may be the most important the important level of, of, uh, of aspirational values that they see in the American uh, civil society. And it's important not just to be free, but to project the reasons that our, that our press is free, because it's the undergirding of our, of our democracy and our entire civilization. I, I just want to take one quick, make one quick response, too, and then thank our, our panel, because I think your question is vitally important. This country is the beacon in many ways of these sorts of things. What happens here does matter. It is a model. Uh, I've been to many gatherings of journalists from around the world and they will say, you know, how do we get to a Freedom of Information Act like you have in the United States? Uh, understand this about uh, being a, a journalist in our part of the world. We don't have a First Amendment. Understand this about being a journalist in our part of the world. We don't have journalism schools that teach the kinds of things that you teach built on the experience that you've had. It really does matter. And for a president to say that the media or the, the, the journalism is the opposition party or the enemy, I am worried about language like enemy of American people. No president should talk about that. President shouldn't turn Americans against Americans, period, no matter what walk of life they're from. But we, we need to model what we have pioneered. And that, that, that needs to be modeled in, in every way and every day. I think in some ways the most powerful part of the White House Correspondents Association dinner Saturday night was that video that rolled in that had not just Ronald Reagan in it, but also George W. Bush in it and Barack Obama in it and Bill Clinton in it, each of whom tangled endlessly with the media and each of whom said, this is just part of the job. We'll call it an occupational hazard. It's called a free press. And it's, uh, it's annoying, but it is what keeps us accountable and transparent and honest. And that should be accompanied, I would say, by this in closing. The media, in, in our own turn, need to bring a little humility to the table. All right? We are not trusted. We are not transparent enough. We can do a better job explaining what we do, why we do, who we talk to, and why. And I think that's another message, and it's part of the question I was asking earlier. How do you convey to people that this is a fact? We have to be educating people every day as to where does this information come from? How do we get it? How can you rely on it? We can't assume that people know that, that that's just somehow intuited. I think that needs to be a much more conscious campaign in a very more and increasingly dangerous world. Would you join me in thanking this amazingly wonderful panel? Well done. Thanks, Elise. Thank, Thank you. you so much.